And like um, Todd, I cannot speak on behalf of all medium-sized publishers, much as I would like to. So I'm, I'm, uh, um, um, I actually I started out my career with Elsevier on my uh, as a professional editor on my my favourite journal, um, and that was I had an experience of a large publisher there and um, learned a huge amount. And then I went to PLOS, um, and more recently at Hindawi. So I will be focusing uh, a little bit on us initially, um, but also. Uh, what I want to say and what I hope I, I managed to convey is, is, is something that, that resonates with, with uh, uh, some of the publishers and other stakeholders in the room. So the first thing is, is uh, we are an open access uh, publisher. We have been since 2007. We publish more than 20,000 um, articles a year. So I presume that's what put us in the middle size category. Um, we are open access, and for us, and like other native open access publishers, that means uh, no embargoes, free access, and reuse with a very <clears throat> liberal uh, license as long as the creator is um, uh, attributed properly and appropriately for that work. Um, as some of you know, we also have a radically open approach to developing infrastructure for open science. So it's not just about open access, it's about open source, open data, and in this context, it's about the metadata, which is a lot of what we're talking about today. But it is also about data sharing as well, uh, the larger issues. It's about open integrations, and it's about open contracts. Um, it's about no lock-in, and it's about transparency um, in our process and practice as well as in our outputs. And one of the things that Paul uh, said in this blog post was that most of the data needed to support open science is controlled by commercial companies. I'd just like to take note here that we, we are a commercial company, both big and small. This growing reliance on a handful of companies to provide proprietary analytics and decision tools for research funders and universities poses serious risks for the future. Um, then I want to switch just with that in mind, to, to, to Crossref, and this is one of their um, new reporting tools, uh, which we love, because apparently Hindawi is the top of the league tables in terms of we, we make um, as much as possible open. Um, so, um, and I will talk about I4OC in a little bit, but um, actually Hindawi uh, didn't really need to join the campaign because it was already making its references open before then. Um, and. Uh, even down to 96% of our abstracts. Um, and there's actually, uh, I think, only about 4% of abstracts which are, are currently open and available. And the reason why, um, and I, I think it's, it's, um, it, it's not just because we were a native open access publisher that we were able to take advantage of the sort of digital environment in a different way. I think there are plenty of open access publishers who, who can't. There are plenty of uh, uh, small open access scholarly publishers who don't have DOIs yet. Um, when I was at PLOS and we were, we were, I, I was um, helping on the I4OC um, campaign, uh, we, we had to scramble a little bit to make sure that we, 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 we had all our references open before launch. Um, uh, and that sort of thing. So, I, you know, I think that there are, there are technical issues um, that face all publishers. Um, but the reason uh, we do it is it because it makes um, the content, the outputs, easy to discover, easy to access. It could be mined. And it's not just the services that Crossref provides, which are incredibly useful and point uh, to the integrity of what we're publishing, but it's, it, it's also out there for the Googles, the academia.edu's, um, the Bings, the, the, whoever, whoever needs to find scholarly information. Um, and this extends, our approach extends to open source in terms of the platforms, and a very important part of that is about working with others and being collaborative and working with the community to create um, um, platforms and services um, and tools um, for, the, uh, um, for publishing and for, for scholarly communication. So I want to talk a little bit about the initiative for open citations. Um, and I think this is a sort of um, a tension point. It, it's one of the things that, that, that uh, I mean, Crossref was a neutral party in this. Um, they facilitated it. Publishers just had to make their references open. 
uh, but it, it sort of encapsulates some of the tensions that we're talking about um, today. And um, metadata was provided to Crossref. Lots of publishers didn't know that they could actually, it was, just, it was just closed by default, could make that metadata openly available. And so the campaign was just about letting uh, publishers know really that they could make that uh, metadata available like all the other meta metadata uh, that uh, Crossref provides. And um, we, we had a huge number of, of, of uh, support from uh, publishers and stakeholders, including every single size of publisher and, uh, and very large publishers, um, um, like Wiley and Springer Nature, Taylor and Francis Sage, Sage and others. Um, everyone could see what the potential benefit, and I'm sure Ludo is going to talk about this uh, later. Um, and, and one of the, best, the benefits was best articulated, actually, um, uh, by the scientometric community. Uh, references are a product of scholarly work and represent the backbone of science, demonstrating the origin and advancement of knowledge and provide essential information for studying science and making decisions about the future of research. References are generated by the academic community and should be freely available to this community. And this is where I think scholarly publishing is different from other aspects of the publishing industry because the metadata is actually part of the scholarly knowledge and how, how, how knowledge is exchanged depends on the metadata that we provide with our content. Um, I, and I don't think we can divorce um, research and publishing and the communication and exchange of scholarly knowledge, we can't separate them out because I think scholarly communication and publishing is actually a discipline within uh, scholarly practice uh, and research. And um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm hoping that Ludo will also speak to that. Um, but this is, this is where the tension is. And of the top biggest, uh, 20 biggest publishers with citation data, now all but four, we've got about 55% now. And I can't remember how many billion references that represents. All but four make them available via Crossref, and, and two represent scholarly societies. And there's, you know, there's, there's they ha they have sound reasons, commercial reasons, not to release these data. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to that uh, a bit in a minute. In a minute. Um, but we also know. And this is where I'm, I'm talking a, a little bit about more of the middle-sized publishers. There are lots of learned societies who are really committed, actually, to making a transition to open access and to open science. Um, this is one that has literally sprung out of the woodwork in the past year, um, um, uh, precipitated a, a bit by Plan S, I think. Um, it's called the Society Publishers Coalition, and um, Stuart Taylor, um, has helped uh, with, with um, others to form this group. And they share a common ambition to see an orderly and sustainable transition to open scholarship and to improve the efficiency of the scholarly communication ecosystem for the benefit of researchers and society at large in a fair and sustainable way. And, you, you know, I, I think, I think that's, that sort of says it all. Um, it doesn't mean it's easy, but there is a desire by publishers and by the, the learned publishers in the scholarly community um, um, to try and, and, and get uh, to have some kind of shared common goal. And um, uh, I think uh, Stuart told me there are now 55 members. Or they're all learned societies, they, some from the States um, as well, though it's mainly UK-based and all disciplines. So what is 21st century scholarly publishing? And so I think it's, uh, and this is, this is my definition, it's not anyone else, but I, I see it as a process and practice, a, a discipline in itself, that facilitates scholarship and the public exchange of scholarly knowledge. And it essentially does what scholars have, have been doing for hundreds of years, creating, discovering, and disseminating knowledge for the benefit of science and society. And I know this sounds like motherhood and apple pie, um, um, but I do think, uh, you know, this is part of a, a, a global 21st century knowledge revolution, and we are part of that. Um, and I, I, I think it's actually hard. I think it's quite hard. Um, 
And the result has been uh, an increasing anger and polarization of the debate and the discussion. So open access versus closed access, green versus gold. You know, it happens within open, um, the open uh, sort of access and open science movement. Good science versus open science, on the other hand. Um, arts, humanities, and social sciences versus science, technology, and I mean, biomedicine. It's all being led by a biomedical community. It's top-down funders are forcing us to do stuff versus bottom-up. It's academic freedom versus academic responsibility, commercial versus not-for-profit, um, pay-to-read versus pay-to-publish, global north versus global south. And I think these are all false dichotomies, all of them. Um, um, and it is not helpful to, to have that view uh, and, and if we want to actually manage this revolution um, and, and for the benefit of all of us um, to come at it uh, from a very polarised viewpoint. So what is 21st century scholarship? Who gets to decide? Probably not publishers. Um, I don't know. These are a few words I put down. Lots of groups are looking at this at the moment. It's global, collaborative, diverse, transparent, ethical, impactful, insightful. Um, it's essentially, it's, it's about a culture of knowledge, creation, curation, and communication that will ultimately reflect core shared values around the exchange and communication of uh, scholarly knowledge. Um, but I, there, are, there, are, there are plenty of groups and, 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 and experts working on this. And the other thing I want to say is that openness is not a panacea. Um, and that's the other thing. It's, it's, it's uh, thank you. Um, it's, um, it's, again, not a black and white argument. Openness is not a panacea if the outputs then can't be trusted or reused by others. And so with openness comes responsibility. And I'm not going to focus much on this, but there are there are plenty of aspects to openness which cause concern and which we have to be aware of as we transition to a more open, global, networked um, environment. The one I suppose I want to pick up on in, 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 in reference to um, why we're here at this meeting is that uh, no matter how much information you put out there, it's not very useful and it can obscure if it isn't fair. Um, and, you know, if we, ha if we release an avalanche of information in a format that cannot be mined, analysed or understood by others, there's no point putting it out there. And the metadata, the infrastructure and the pipework that connects objects to articles, to outputs, to people, to funders um, uh, and to others, it is part of that information that needs to be independently mined, analysed and understood by others. Those are as much scholarly outputs as the articles and data sets um, that are out there. So the bottom line, um, our view um, at Hindawi, um, and I think it reflects a, lo a lot of the, the sort of nat native open access publishers like uh, PLOS and others, uh, but it is not to be a gatekeeper to the exchange of scholarly knowledge, but a facilitator. And what we can do is we can aim to intrinsically align our interests with those of the research community who want to harness 21st technology. The only reason we're here is because it's feasible. We can do this. Um, I think commercial players have an absolutely vital role to play. I think large commercial players have a hugely important role to play. There's a massive amount of experience um, um, within those organizations. They've uh, Again, it's not black and white. They've invested a huge amount of time, effort, and money. I mean, when you think about the work that Elsevier done, ha, has done on, on data linking and data citation or, uh, and these types of things, there's a huge amount of experience there. Um, it's not either or, it's, it's and both. And can we, um, as a community of publishers or, or, or as a community of uh, publishing services, um, I don't know how you want to define a publisher uh, um, uh, these days, but can we be as open-minded and collaborative in our approach to publishing and scholarly comms as we ask um, others, and particular researchers, to be in theirs? So Crossref. And what are the practices, services, and tools that best support the publication and exchange of scholarly knowledge? Uh, and, and this, uh, an exchange, because I see, I see Crossref as, as the hub for exchange. It's like a massive junction box or this, this planet, solar systems, whatever. Um, but 
can Crossref adapt to this uh, changing technology and the tools that are out there uh, so that it benefits all its potential members, including the new entrants and OA publishers, whether large or small, commercial or not-for-profit? And then um, I suppose, you know, the big elephant in the room is should or is Crossref uh, being or, or should Crossref be held up by the commercial interests of one or two large actors who want to ensure that the infrastructure and metadata is proprietary if this is at the expense of competition, innovation, and ultimately science and society? And I don't think we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think there's a place for uh, all of us to work together. And how, we can, how can we collaborate uh, to build on our strengths. Um, and there are issues, as Todd was saying, about governance and sustainability, and I'm just about finished. So, two wheel size change can only take place, this is Paul Aris for uh, in Lero, where there's trust, collaboration, and a commitment to a shared vision for the future. Um, and um, that's what I hope, one of the things that will come out uh, of, of this meeting with. And I think it is not open access or open science or even openness that is at the core of scholarly communication, but rigor, trust, diversity, inclusive, inclusivity, collaboration, curiosity, and creativity, the things that make up scholarship itself. So how can we all work with Crossref to make that happen? Thank you. Thank you very much.